let, let me start with the first question. Uh, everyone has a, a metal background. So uh, I, I, I think you grew up in the 70s, 80s. Uh, when you were a kid, uh, how did you get into heavy metal music? Which record was the first one do you recall about, okay, this is the music I, I like? You know, growing up in the 70s, um, even programs like Top of the Pops, I mean, you could have like the Sex Pistols, Motorhead, The Damned, um, ELO, and, you know, and, you know, joke pop bands, you know, on all at the same time. So it, it was really good period before pop music got hold of the, the main show that everyone had. You've got introduced to a lot of different styles of music. So, you know, I was a kid, I heard, you know, like Thin Lizzy and Wizard and bands like this. And I always enjoyed um, the rock side of things. It's like Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody. I remember that being on the TV completely. I'd never seen anything like it outside of Doctor Who. But um, it, and I did, it was quite amazing, really. But I think the, uh, the one that where I made my decision, it's like, right, metal only for a bit anyway. Uh, was Number of the Beast I made in March 1982. Um, I was watching yeah, Top of the Box again, and I'd seen Run to the Hills a few weeks before, and I thought, oh, that's, that's really good. And then all, then Number of the Beast video came on, and I was just like, oh, that's it. And so since March 1982, metal's been my main thing. And the weird thing is, re in the last 10 years, I've been doing charity bike rides with um, bicycle rides with yeah, Five Maidens manager. So it, it all comes around. And he's from the same hometown as me, Huddersfield. So then I quickly got like Iron Fist by Motorhead had just come out. I got um, MSG, Michael Schenker Groups, One Night at Buddha Khan live that I borrowed off Tuds, our original drummer. He sat behind me at school from the age of 11, you see. Um, so I've known him all these years. And he lent me those two and Kiss Alive too. <laughs> but the first rock album I actually got was um, Rush, Farewell to Kings. And it's still in my top five albums of all time. Do you still listen to the classics? To be honest, I think um, I think you when you get older, you sort of, you, it's like walking down memory lane. Because every record you buy, you attach it to a different memory or different period in your right. life. And, you know, it's like I remember the day when I was 17 when I bought King Diamond's Abigail, for instance. It was the last time I ever got the bus home from the record store because the week after I, I uh, passed my driving test. So it's little things I remember in the old days when you used to get the vinyl. Well, you can buy vinyl now. But I'd be sitting on the bus and I just used to read all the lyrics and the thanks list. And I used to love doing it, you know, with like Celtic Frost records and stuff like that, you know. I'd like the Iron Maiden records. I mean, they're just trying to find the small details in the artwork. Right, There's lots right. of stuff to enjoy, you know. It's quite simply back then, you know. What music do you do you listen oftenly? Do you have time to listen to music nowadays? I'm the only member of Paradise Lost who lives in London, so I usually fly to, especially in festival season like now. I fly on my own quite a lot, so I like, you know. I mean, I usually have a Kindle, so I read a book and I'll put different music on. If there's turbulence. I usually put on like ELO or something like that, something upbeat that I love. I'll put on like Mr. Blue Sky and then I'll put on something like Don't Stop Me Now by Queen because you can't be miserable if you're in that song. But I listen to all sorts really because that's the wonderful thing about music is it, there's always something to suit your mood. Um, but when I'm reading, because I, I read a lot of, uh, well, on the Kindle, I read a lot of books while I'm traveling and I quite like instrumental music. Uh, um, like Jean Michel Jarre or Focus, you know, Hocus Pocus by Focus. That you know, um, I listen to quite a lot of stuff. I mean, funnily enough, I bumped into a band last week at Metal Days that a friend of mine recommended to me last year called Gate Creeper. Yeah, uh, yeah. and I bumped into them. They, they were playing, and I watched their set from the side of stage, and they were brilliant. And so we were all chatting afterwards. But yeah, so the, every now and then you it it. You almost find them by chance, and they're always the best ones. Um, but, yeah, generally, I listen to a lot of old music, really. Stuff that I liked when I was growing up at different points, really. Yeah, right. but sometimes, you know, there's still lots of great music out there. But And when, you know, you find something like Gate Creeper just took me back to a period of time when 
when I was like a late teenager, was around the time we formed PL, that kind of stuff, the, I would have loved that band when I was 18. I'd have been like, they'd be my favourite band, you know. So, yeah, there's still some great bands in there, but sometimes you find them at a festival when we play. Or, you know, like a, like I said, a friend of mine who was a DJ, he put them on an Instagram story as it back in music. And I thought, yeah, that's good. Who's that? And, you know, sometimes it just happens like that, you know. Right, and when and when that that young guys that you perhaps discover their music uh, have the opportunity to know you on on festivals, uh, are they amazed or surprised? Oh, Aaron, eighty, look after our band. No, no, I mean, it's a legend. Yeah, I know. I mean, I mean, they said they do like PL, and even said there might even be a couple of PL bits on the new album they've just finished. Uh, but, but um, no, I mean, and do you know what? That's a, the biggest compliment you can ever get is when someone, uh, someone makes music, and they and they like your band, and that makes them want to make more music. Not necessarily your, your music, but the emotion they get from listening to some music makes them want to make their own. That's amazing. You know, it's the right. biggest compliment you can ever have. But the good thing, I mean, with with Paradise Lost, I mean, everyone in the band, where because. Because of where we're from in the north of England, you're not allowed to get a big head. <laughs> so um, every, everybody is very grounded. So we we don't. I don't know. We still think of ourselves as like four working class lads from the north. Really, we don't. We, I, the the whole it, it's it's weird. People thinking about we just make make music, and we're very lucky that. 35 and a half years later, people actually enjoy listening to it. And linking to that, I, I, I was going to ask you because, you know, in, in our YouTube channel, every Friday we made uh, uh, the releases of the week. There are hundreds of, of young heavy metal groups and bands uh, going for, for, that, for that dream to, to live for, for, what they, for what is their passion, their music. When did you mm. uh, did you realize that the music was a way of, of life and, and you could do that for a for a living? The weird thing is, even when Paradise Lost had been going for about four or five years, you still you never thought beyond the next few years, really. So you never, I, I would never have believed you would still be going twenty five years later, yet alone thirty five years later. I think the first time you realize it's what you want to do is when you get in a room for the first time with other musicians and it clicks. And that's what happened with Paradise Lost. I've been in a couple of other local bands or just playing with friends. They weren't really bands, but playing with friends. But with Paradise Lost, there was something where it was just like, oh, when you're playing, you're like, oh, this is, this is great, you know. And I think that's the moment where you get the bug, where you want to do it more. I mean, but we never. I mean, we never dreamed. I mean, we'd we'd have it as a career or anything. Um, I mean, even when we brought out our first album, we couldn't believe it. We we were actually on vinyl. We couldn't believe it, you know. Uh, so, and it, you know, it. We still can't believe it. <laughs> I think to a degree. Um, but yeah, like I say, it's 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 um, it's quite humbling that. After all this time, it's still something um, we can we can do, and taking our music and sharing it with people, especially for me, I love playing live. Sharing how much I love the music with people who are enjoying it too, best feeling in the world. Can't beat that, you know. Right, right. And yeah. as, as long as as long as we as long as we enjoy it and playing together, we'll probably do it. You know. You are uh, making uh, a new album with Paradise Lost. Uh, can you tell us what this is about? Uh, will you follow the Obsidian line or will you experiment? It's still very early. I mean, we've only got the first few tracks. And to be honest, even when we get, usually when we get halfway through, we still don't know what the other half's going to be like. There's a general theme, but... Um, the thing is, there's only been preliminary writing so far. So there's about there's a few songs, but once we finish touring this year and start finishing the album next year, it might change slightly again. Uh, I mean, this year we've been we've re-recorded Icon, which has been great fun to do. Actually, 
I love it. I love revisiting the old albums and there's certainly, you know, cause obviously there's usually about three or four that you've played live for definite. And then there's some other gems and you think, Oh God, we never played this live. Why not? You know, it's such a good song. Uh, so that's been really good fun to do. Uh, and then we're going to be doing some icon shows at the end of the year. And I think once we've got the icon shows out of the way, that's when the band sort of locks, locks down into serious songwriting. I think there'll be a few song, few more songs done before then. But yeah, once Greg and Nick, they kind of they prefer to write when they're in songwriting mode, if you know what I mean. And they've got the time and they're not thinking about concerts or anything. They quite like, they can do it a bit, but the, when they seriously get into that songwriting mode, that's when it happens to its fullest. Many opinions are divided, uh, or which is the, the best album, uh, the best Paradise Lost album. Uh, for you, what is the, the best album? I always used to say my my, <laughs> my favorite ELO album is the very best of ELO. Uh, but it's, uh, I don't know. Do you know what? It's like I was saying earlier, with the each album is like a stepping stone. Um, in life, for for each for each of us, um, very different memories attached to each one. And each album, we tried to make the best album we could at the time. So they're all very special. Um, but you know, it's 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 difficult. I mean, oh, I don't know. Obsidian is a great record. I thought the Plague Within was the most complete record we'd done in a long time. The thing is, like revisiting Icon, I, you know, I love it. Absolutely love Icon. Drag Times, there isn't a bad song on it. You know, it's, it's, do you know what? It's like choosing your favorite child. You can't do it, you know, <laughs> at least not in public. <laughs> there's, there's songs on every album that I absolutely love. And that, that makes it harder, really. Um, it's like Will pretending on believing nothing. I mean, that wouldn't be a lot of people's. Favorite piano, maybe it is. I think for some people it's, it's weird because it also depends. Sometimes it depends what your first album is that you're introduced to a band by. I mean, for me, it's Farewell to Kings because that was the first one I got. You know, um, Number of the Beast is my favorite Iron Maiden record because it was the one that got me into it. So I think we do get people saying Believe in Nothing is their favorite because. That they, they were sort of, I don't know, 18, they were going out drinking, that was their party album or whatever at the time. And for me, it's like the gods, the song, like Will Pretending, and um, there's, there's the B-side as well, one of the B-sides on the album. It's it's one of my favourite top five PL songs of all time, and it's a B-side. Uh, but it's, yeah, that's why I can't pick a favourite album, because there's, there's tunes I like on every album. It's like one second, we haven't played Disappear live for a long time i'd love to get that back in the set you know as much as we write albums sometimes there are songs where you go oh i like that one it's like over the madness that might come back into the set in the near future because i've been really pushing for it i think guido has been asking for it as well he fancies playing it so and i love that song we absolutely love it so but that's the problem we've got so many songs and only so much time to play them in live you know It's all right me playing them at home, but yeah, playing live, it's, uh, that's where you really want to share it, really. What I lost is um, a, a, gothic, a gothic metal pioneers. Uh, do you agree with that? Ooh. Well, there weren't really many before us, I don't think. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I can see why we, we, we get put down with that. And I would say probably yes. Um, Because, I mean, even when we sort of left school and just before we started the band, music was still very segregated. You had rock fans, you had punks, you had, everything was still kind of, you had goths, and everything was kind of separate still when I was at school. And then things started intertwining and mixing a bit, like you had anthrax mixing thrash and rap and things like that, you know. So music people started being more fluid, With mixing their genres and we because i mean in the north goth music is the perfect thing plus most most of the best goth bands are from the north of england but um it kind of goth music fits the mood of the weather <laughs> as much as anything and i think and, and metal together the same thing and we almost kind of 
Well, we, it was never a, a thing we really thought about. We just we, we, we loved bands like Sister the Mercy, you know, and the Mission and and the Cure, and we loved metal, you know, like death metal and stuff. So it was kind of always going to happen, really. Um, I mean, we we might have been a bit more sort of speed metal, really, but um, Tud's. Uh, with his diabetes, he couldn't do the fast drumming for a long time, so that's why we became a slow band. So, Tuds has got a lot to do with that. <laughs> he, he's been my friend now, bloody hell. 42 years we've been friends, from since the first day he sat behind me at school, and then we formed PL together. But now he's off. He's a TV director now, so he just, he's done very well for himself. You're, you're touring next this weekend? No, the next weekend you're, you're re... You start. You you're getting on tour again. What then? Re starting to re as you said, recording the yeah, new al album. Uh, yeah, well, and getting in the studio. Yeah, for, from the start of 24 on 2024, it's all about new album until it's done. Yeah. Oh. So the Icon shows in December where they'll be the last thing, the last shows we play before we finish the album. I, I hope so we can just concentrate on it. We we can look forward for a new PL album, perhaps for the for the the last days of 2024, or is it too optimistic? No, it'll be 2024. Yeah. It will be 2024. I, I don't know when. It's going to be the summer at the earliest, and autumn at the latest, probably. In 2018, uh, your last time with the band in, in South America. Uh, how do you remember your time here in South America? It's all. Do you know what? It's South America is, has been since well, since we were first there in twenty in nineteen ninety five. That's a uh, yes. It, it, it's always amazing. Great passion, you know. Um, we haven't made it to Montevideo or or Uruguay yet, so that would be great. The cure is coming this year, so perhaps that is oh, a, that is a sign. Of <laughs> Yeah, do you know what? Um, if you get the, if you've never seen them, go see them. They're great live, okay. really good live. Yeah, I, I mean, he, forget, you know, forget the ages of bands. Go and enjoy the music because they they still sound amazing. Going back to the, I mean, every time we've been, the last time we came, it was it was absolutely fantastic. I think we played about five shows in Brazil as well. Um, every time we come, the people are always so welcoming and. And as and as importantly, so passionate during the show. I mean, I absolutely love it. I mean, we've only got one South American show this year, and that was for Mexico. I'm I'm hoping that we get a chance to do a proper South American tour with the new album next year. That would be perfect. We did one tour once in South America, and the guy. This is probably about 20 years ago or something. And the guy hadn't really considered. It, it, I think he was just trying to make sure he didn't lose money. So it was all really quick, and I think we did. 10 shows in like 11 or 12 days and we were, we were literally getting back to the hotel about three in the morning after we got left the venue and then we were going to the airport at four in the morning and wow. that happened for about eight eight days in a row i mean we were completely shattered and then we, when you land because it might be like a six hour flight seven hour flight or whatever you land and then you went straight to the venue Then you went for some dinner, then you played the gig, and then you did the same thing. And that was real. That was the one tour where we were like, we can't, we can't do it. I mean, I mean, that was, we, I was 20 years younger. I couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, but yeah, no, and the last few times we've been, we've been looked after so well. The promoters have been fantastic. Um, couldn't have been nicer, actually. And <laughs> everything was uh, planned with the human side. It's probably very expensive to bring a European band over and fly them around. Right. So I get that, you know, I get that. So it would be nice to do a few more places. I mean, if we ever do as many countries in South America as Napalm Def, I'll be happy. Those guys go everywhere. It's amazing. Yeah. I love the, the thing is the Napalm guys. We've known them since 1989. They're good friends, you know. Yeah, they they tour loads. I mean, fair play. 